It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be here this evening to tell you about our book, Traveling the World for National Geographic, and to share with you some of the adventures of my late husband, Tom Abercrombie. The handsome couple on the cover <laughs> are Tom and I, somewhere in the Swiss Alps, the summer of 1962. Tonight, I will share some personal stories, and my lovely daughter, Mari, will read quotes from the book. We open the book with a, my favorite quote of Tom's. The most satisfying journey is one that is shared. Indeed, he not only shared his adventures with me and our family and friends, but with the millions of readers of National Geographic magazine. He brought awareness of the beauty of other cultures and customs. In nearly 40 years of travel, Tom worked on all seven continents with stories from the far corners of the earth. His fascination with the Middle East began with his first overseas assignment, the country of Lebanon. Lebanon was a mind bender. Despite research beforehand, I arrived with a mindful of cliches that so many Americans seem to harbor about the Middle East. Camels, wealthy desert sheiks, veiled women, oil wells, belly dancers, armed conspirators, old men smoking water pipes, Persian carpets. In Lebanon, you'll find all of these and more except for the oil wells, if you look hard enough. But they are lost amid the luxury hotels, green valleys, terraced orchards, the latest European fashions, tra traffic jams, crowded universities, snowy mountain peaks, and splendid ball deck with the finest Roman ruins outside of Rome itself. Gourmet restaurants, museums, international bankers, and water skiing on the Mediterranean. Beirut had been called the Paris of the Middle East. It's all that and more. Whatever your heart desires, in those days, you could find it in the heady mix of Europe and the Orient, that is Beirut. That was Lebanon in 1957, the Paris of the Middle East, the land of milk and honey. But Tom's career was about to change. Back once more in Washington, I found Melville Bill Grosvenor very pleased with my efforts in Lebanon, pictures and words, and he had scheduled the story for the coming April. What's more, he called me into his office to announce my promotion to National Geographic's foreign editorial staff, a prestigious team of writer-photographers that, as the name would imply, handle most overseas assignments, the most interesting ones by far. Tom's ability to adapt to any situation made him a Renaissance man. Along with his curiosity, ability, and guts, he made for the perfect geographic field man. Early in his career at National Geographic, Tom did a story on ice fishing. We decided, he decided that is, there should be a fish eyes view. He had designed an underwater housing for the camera. We drove out on the ice where he tied a rope around his waist and made his way into the icy water. The result, an amazing view of a family <laughs> hoping to catch a fish. My job was to get him back to our warm hotel room. Driving in the car, I couldn't help but burst out laughing. Tom looked like a walrus <laughs> in that black diving suit with his big mustache covered with icicles. He did not appreciate my sense of humor. <laughs> <clears throat> Some of the photographs from this assignment resulted in Magazine Photographer of the Year Award. Three years earlier, while in Milwaukee, he had earned the Newspaper Photographer of the Year Award. Tom was the first to win both awards. 
He loved a challenge. Every assignment presented him with something new, and he embraced that challenge. The ability to handle any situation can save your life while you're in the field. Tom had developed a reputation around the office for his many accidents. <laughs> he survived a, a charter plane crash, a cable car accident, in addition to his many automobile escapades. In northern Saudi Arabia, when we were working on the Frankincense Trail story, we came across the ruins of the old Hejaz Railroad built in 1900 to carry Muslims to Medina. Remember T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia? He and his men had blown up the trains and demolished the stations during World War I, left as it is if it had happened yesterday. We took many photographs, of course. When the images of the train laying on its side hit the desk of the director of photography, Bob Gilka, he declared, oh my God, Abercrombie's done it again, <laughs> and this time it's a train. <clears throat> My first trip into the Middle East was to Saudi Arabia in 1965. I was fascinated with that part of the world. As a woman traveling with her husband, I had no problem. The men often invited me to join their coffee ceremonies and dinners as well. The women were friendly and curious, but it was difficult for me because of my vocabulary of Arabic was a limit to about 10 words. If I was able to haul out my cameras by spending time making pictures, they seemed to understand and cooperate. They were far more curious about me because back then there were few foreign women visitors. We are going to make a trip into the empty quarter, the Ruble Kali a desert the size of Texas, where no one lives. Tom's goal was to find the famous Wabar meteorite, which other explorers had been searching for for years. We traveled in our Land Rover south to the edge of the desert, where we visited the Bura tribe, famous for their tracking skills. We loved the deserts and our visits with the Bedouins. Their hospitality is unmatched. That evening, after dinner, Tom and the Sheikh exchanged these words. Lynn and I feel much like nomads ourselves, I said. Our Land Rover is our camel, I went on. While you move from place to place to find rain and grass, we travel constantly looking for stories and photographs. I caught a slight smile. So why, in Allah's name, why would you want to venture further into this dangerous desert? For a foreigner, it's especially dangerous, he persisted. And in the end, it's a journey to nowhere. The Sheikh finally gave in and assigned his nephew Jabber to lead us to the Wabar meteorite, and most important, to get us back. Traveling for four days in the intense heat, 120 degrees up to 140 degrees. Our backup truck had a leaky radiator, draining our precious water supply. Tensions were growing when Jobber pointed and said, it's just over the next dune. He had led us directly to the crater, the biggest iron meteorite ever found in Arabia lay at our feet. Shaped roughly like a saucer, it measures four feet in diameter and two feet in the center. A little quick geometry put it at two and a half tons. Years later, in 2007, when I was in Riyadh, well, the, the Saudi government had an exhibition of Tom's photographs, I was surprised to find the Wabar meteorite 
on display at the entrance of the new National Museum. After Tom's first pilgrimage to Mecca, he wrote, while I was in Saudi Arabia, I wanted to cover the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Non-believers are not permitted to enter the holy city, but the year before I had embraced Islam. I joined three million of the faithful from all around the world to complete the pilgrimage to Mecca. I was one of the lucky Westerners allowed to photograph the passionate celebration. The power and beauty of the Meccan experience needs no translation. Tom wrote in his Arab history article, The Sword and the Sermon, published in 1972, of his touching experience in Alma Ata in the Soviet Union. He had been visiting a mosque there. The Sheikh told his guests that Haj Omar, Tom's Islamic name, had been to Mecca and Medina. <clears throat> a devotion denied by Soviet policy to all but a token few. People began to press against him, to kiss his hand. Some stroked his coat, then touching their face to whatever blessing might rub off Haj Omar had to leave, choking back tears. My favorite country will always be Oman, the Sultanate of Oman. For me, the highlight was the Musandam Peninsula, a rugged area separate from the rest of the country, reachable only by air or boat. The rugged area had a unique culture, living as they had for centuries while well, super tankers just offshore through the Straits of Hormuz brought oil to ports around the world. I couldn't stop photographing the women especially. This image of a masked woman almost made the cover of the Oman story. As you can see from these images of Oman, it is one of the most colorful and friendly countries. And Oman will always have a special place in my heart because it was a gateway assignment that led to other assignments for me, including the Frankincense Trail, where I was designated photographer. I was especially happy to be back in Oman to start the Frankincense Trail story. We had experienced over and over the ceremony of lighting the incense burners, passing it around, for you to woof the vapors into your hair and clothing, the perfume of ancient times. I believe Tom's spirit is on his impressive body of work and in the minds of the readers who followed his travels and his countless friends he made along the way. We'll leave you with a quote that says it well, if I even add one plank to the bridges of understanding between countries, I feel my mission was accomplished. Thank you for coming this evening.